Hey guys, welcome to another video. Here we have a 2012 iMac 27 inch with the Intel Core i7 CPU and 24 gigs of RAM. Today we're going to reseal the screen and upgrade it to macOS Sequoia. If you really enjoy these videos and this type of tech stuff, please like, subscribe and share this video and also make sure the bell icon is turned on. Okay, so here's the backstory. A few years ago, this Mac had some intermittent issues. The thought was that the hard disk was starting to fail, but because of those frustrating one-time seal kits for like 25 bucks a piece, we used some electrical tape as a temporary fix to hold the screen in place until we confirmed that this was actually the issue. Unfortunately, temporary became a little less temporary. Being a 2012, this iMac should support target display through Thunderbolt. Although, according to Apple's docs, you need to run High Sierra or earlier to get it to work. Is that something we should test? Drop a comment below. Based on all the dust poking out this vent, I think we're going to need to give this thing a good cleaning too. The bottom factory seal was never fully cut. I thought about leaving it, but then I decided it would be easier to clean both surfaces with the screen fully removed. Even though you've cut the old adhesive and separated the screen, you still need to remove the residual adhesive bits. I find it's much easier to remove when this is heated up. You have to be really careful though because you don't want to melt the plastic. The key is to get it warm, not hot. I used alcohol to thoroughly clean both surfaces. It is imperative that you have both surfaces fully cleaned in order to have a good adhesion of the new adhesive. I want to be extremely clear at this point. VHB tape is not the correct product to use here. There is a purpose-built seal kit specifically for this. I don't use the seal kit because it's expensive, around 25 bucks each time I want to open an iMac, and you need a different kit depending on the size of the iMac, the 21 and a half versus the 27 inch. Some people have claimed the non-genuine seal kits come loose, and you can't buy the genuine ones because Apple won't sell them. But there are also reports of VHB tape being both impossible to open when you intend to keep it closed and screens falling out when you intend for the adhesive to stay attached. No one seems to have a perfect solution, so this is the route I chose. I'm using E6000 in the corners for added adhesion and I'm going to adjust the fan curve on the Max cooler to keep the internals heat down. Final cleanup of the electrical tape goo, residual E6000, and fingerprints. Although this iMac officially supports Catalina, it is actually still running Mojave. We're gonna fix that. OpenCore Legacy Patcher does have a feature to automatically grab the installer and create the USB stick. However, I like to keep an archive copy of the installers just in case I need them down the road. So I'm going to use my standalone installer and I'm going to use the manual method. This is actually the official way to make a USB installer according to Apple's official docs. So now we actually have the official USB installer here, but at the moment it will only work on officially supported Macs, which this one isn't. We use OpenCore Legacy Patcher to build OpenCore for our Mac model and install it onto our installer USB we just made. This leaves the macOS installer, OpenCore bootloader, and necessary OpenCore patches for our specific Mac all on the same USB stick. OpenCore is a compatibility layer. It tricks macOS into thinking your Mac is supported when it isn't. 
So when you hold option to bring up the boot picker, you're going to get the Apple bootloader with the gray screen. At this point, we want to choose OpenCore to load it first. Next, the OpenCore loader will come up, which looks kind of similar, but it'll have a black background. At that point, you're now booted via OpenCore, and now you can choose the Sequoia installer. So now that OpenCore has loaded the installer, the Mac behaves like an official supported Mac and the installation works exactly like it would on an official Mac. One thing I will mention is with the disk partitioner, make sure that you use an APFS file system. I've had issues in the past where I've accidentally set it to HFS+. Great, we're installed here. You'll notice the wallpaper is missing, and that's okay. This is just a result of needing to install some post-installer patches to bring back hardware acceleration for the graphics card. We'll start by installing the OpenCore bootloader to the system disk. This way we don't need the USB stick every time to boot the system. Now we install the post-install root patches. This patches the system to use drivers from previous versions of macOS that Apple removed, as well as rolls back the metal compatibility to a version that your graphics card supports. This is what restores graphics drivers and full metal hardware acceleration. Another important note here, even if you did download the full OpenCore package with all the drivers included, you will need an internet connection at this point in order to install the metal patches. If you can't get internet directly on your Mac at this point, there are ways to do it offline, but you'll need to read up on the GitHub docs for that. After rebooting, we now have our live wallpaper back and everything is behaving normally. At this point, I install Mac's fan control and set a more aggressive fan curve. Apple really likes to run Macs hot and quiet, but I've always believed in running them cooler that it likely lets the components last longer. Also, running cooler should prevent the VHB tape from coming loose as easily. One last thing that needs to be done on this Mac is to install VMware Fusion. Okay, this is a step you guys are not gonna be doing, but uh, the owner wants to be able to run some Windows only apps. I'm not sure what the user intends to run on here, I was going to allocate all cores, but then figured the computer may actually run Windows apps alongside Mac apps at some points. So I allocated half the cores, half the RAM, half the storage. Although the virtual disk is thin provisioned, so it won't use actual space until the virtual space is needed. In case you didn't know, VMware Fusion is now free for personal use. Personally, the interface feels a little more clean than VirtualBox. One huge advantage is the support for booting bootcamp partitions, which VirtualBox doesn't have. If that's a feature that's important to you, VMware Fusion might be a good option for you. It also claims to have some DirectX support for games. I haven't had much experience with VMware Fusion, so I'm going to test that. And here it is, the finished product, a cleaned up 27 inch iMac renewed for 2024. So let's take it for a test drive and see how well it runs. We'll start with VMware and load up Midtown Madness 2. This is one of my personal favorites and seems also to have been fondly enjoyed by Clint over at LGR. I must say though, the performance is a little disappointing. Given how old this game is, it should play butter smooth. It's a little jittery and it feels like it's got quite a bit of input lag as well. Realistically, guys, if you want to do gaming on this iMac, you should really be using Boot Camp. If you really need to run a game in a virtual machine inside macOS, then you should probably look into Parallels Desktop. From testing I've seen done, Parallels seems to have a much better performance when it comes to DirectX games. And because I'm sure someone is going to ask, yes, it does run the latest iMovie perfectly. No issues noticed with patched metal graphics, and the renders look perfect as well. I haven't delved into it that far, so perhaps there's something I haven't noticed, but on the surface, it looks perfect. A few people have asked me in the past about GarageBand on OpenCore patch systems. And as far as I can tell, this works perfectly too. 
So, in summary, is this upgrade worth it? I would say absolutely. A 2012 iMac won't update past Catalina, and Catalina has had support fully ended for a while now. And I know some of you are going to ask the same thing that has been asked before. Is this Mac secure with all these patches? Well, here's the deal. You have three options with a 2012 Mac at this point. Run outdated, vulnerable stock Mac OS and outdated software. Two, run an up-to-date Mac OS with up-to-date software with some patched OS components to allow it to run on your old Mac. Or option three, get a newer Mac that has full official support. Most of you watching this either don't find value in buying a new Mac or maybe don't even have the spare cash to buy a new Mac in this economy. The OpenCore team has shown themselves to be very reputable over the years. If I was going to keep an older Mac running, I would personally prefer to run the latest OS with current security patches and have a handful of files modified by a reputable group rather than run severely outdated official operating systems with known security vulnerabilities. That's just my opinion though. I really appreciate you guys sticking around to the end. Thanks so much for watching. Please drop a comment below and tell me about your Mac and your upgrade experience. Also, remember to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and maybe share this video with somebody that you think will find it interesting. Stay curious, keep tinkering, and until next time, happy retro computing, everyone.